talk about the avatar uh, as a figure of transition. You, you defined it as a computational and mediated form of communication. What exactly avatar means in your book? Could you expand on it? Yeah, what I didn't know until I started to look into it that avatar is Sanskrit, so it's got a really ancient tradition, uh, history, etymology, and it, it comes from this idea of the God descends to human form. So it's this transformation, it's bridging of worlds, and it's going from kind of the unlimited of the God to the, the finite and also mission-oriented of the human and often the hero. You have a quest, you have a task that you need human form to be able to accomplish. So that's kind of like the mythological um, history of the term. And then we think about avatars in games where you use it to kind of extend your reach to do things in these um, computational worlds. And one of the reason people really like them is it's exciting. It feels like you are doing something, but this little, this figure, this CGI figure is extending your reach, extending the possibility of what you could do because now you can fly or you can hunt, you can climb trees or you can organize your guild, whatever it is. So then we get to something like James Cameron's hugely popular movie, Avatar, and you have to wonder, what was the story? What is it that people made this the kind of most watched movie in the history of the world? The story is you have a soldier who can't use his physical body anymore and science and technology are advanced enough that he's able to uh, absolutely feel himself manifested in another kind of body. So this is the full thing where it goes from the computer mediation to this still uh, science fiction fantasy of you actually can feel what it's like to be someone else. You can feel what it's like to inhabit a different body and you're powerful in it. You can enact you know, this revolution and battle the military complex and all the rest of it. So that, that fantasy of transition, of inhabiting another body, of extending ourselves and our power, for me that was the interesting thing about the examples of where are we using avatars and also thinking about not just computer generated figures, the representational, but also things like Twitter. How does that present a kind of avatar for you? So I have an icon for me is like Obama, the president of the United States has an Obama uh, Twitter feed. and. It does this kind of thing through language as opposed to visual of it gives you a sense of proximity. You feel like, oh, I'm on a one-to-one -one correspondence with the President of the United States because we're in this intimate channel, of this Twitter stream together. So also thinking about those kinds of manifestations of avatars in terms of extension and also how we have a sense of um, uh, communicating with each other. Mm -hmm. Um, in virtual words, of course, the avatar is an extension of us, but it's kind of embellished and has uh, superpowers. And uh, this is what people started doing social media, mobile media as well. They embellished their their role in society. Um, so how to build trust in, in this virtual world if we our manifestation is an embellished version of ourselves? How people negotiate trust right now in, in those virtual worlds? Yeah, um, there's been a lot of attention paid recently to cyberbullying, which uh, some of those manifestations are people tricking an individual or a community. Uh, this is not, uh, so I'm your friend, or I'm a friendly person, we're interested in the same things, and it actually ends up being somebody who's a predator. So whether it's uh, uh, trying to get under youth uh, children to go with a sexual predator, or whether uh, someone takes advantage of you getting your user information because you think you're friends, you're sharing things, and then they just exploit it and broadcast it in a, uh, in a, in a very hurtful way to, to network. So we have some very uh, 
strong and terrible examples of people's trust being abused. And part of what we've come to understand from this is there's a societal level of education that has to catch up to the societal level of social media use. We're using this stuff willy-nilly. It's exciting. And now we have enough time in to be able to reflect a little bit on what do 10-year-olds need to know when they're on the internet, but what do also 35-year-olds need to know when they're on the internet? It's not just children, even though those are some of the most dr dramatic examples of where education has to happen. So in some ways, this is a practical kind of civic story where you've got, uh, it's not quite the same as teaching people how to cross a street. They have to look both ways. But somehow it has to be in that line of, here's just practical things that everybody needs to know, because this is embedded in what our society is today. So there's that. But then there's the other thing of, Online dating sites were, have been a rich source of um, research because they predate Facebook and you get a lot of usage and there's some really interesting scholarship around. If you think about a dating site, what you want to do is represent yourself in your best light, but you don't want to lie. So if you are, if you're uh, heavy and you say that you're very fit, then actually you cut off in advance the possibility of meeting the person because you know you have misled their expectation. So if you say, oh, you know, I'm aspiring to lose weight, but right now I'm, you know, pleasantly uh, chubby or whatever it is, you let them know what's your, your, the body that you're going to show up in, but you also let them know how charming you are, how interesting you find ways that they want to meet you that are not just based on a fantasy. So dating sites are interesting in terms of people do not have the right motive to lie, out and out lie, but there is this modulation around presenting your best self, presenting your aspirational self. All those things are somehow within the boundaries of what the presentation is about, which is different than just misleading someone, just lying to someone. So if you look at spaces where the consequences of a face-to-face -face meeting are very, very low, there's a lot more opportunity for people to just lie, trick, steal identities, the kind of cyber theft that people are being warned about. But then if you look at other kinds of contexts where some of the goal is face-to-face -face interactions, you see that um, we're very tuned in as media users to lies. If it's the wrong tone in an email, you can't exactly say, well, what was it that triggered it? But we're very sensitive. And since you've got reduced um, stimulus, I don't see all of you. I just get this small part. We've really gotten uh, tuned our ears to understanding uh, uh, false voices. Facebook has a policy uh, already now that when you uh, open an account it asks you whether your account is real or fictional. So do you think in the future we'll have kind of a certification industry or um, a role be it governmental or industrial to secure people that, pe uh, that their avatar is real? This has been a rich source of conversation and also design opportunities for both industry and then some idea of kind of uh, civic population because we already have in terms of business practice or in universities you have degrees of access badges, codes, um, passwords to get access to shared information. So both using the network to share more easily, but then also protecting things that are proprietary or for various reasons cannot circulate freely. So we have a certain level of practice in terms of authentication. And then there's also, and rightly so, a tremendous amount of advocacy. Well. Kind of a tremendous amount, but advocacy around freedom. 
that not every space should be password or sign in. Um, there has to be uh, free space for anonymous use of the internet. And both sides have very valid points and it seems to me that um, we are already making decisions about what needs to be protected and then spaces that we are battling to remain open and free. So if you, if you look at something like WikiLeaks, which falls right in the middle, the information that was leaked was protected by the U.S. government. It was not by any means made for public consumption. And here you have an, uh, a group or perhaps in this case an individual that says this is a whistleblowing capacity. My job as a citizen, as a participant in these nation states and in the world is to let people know about these kinds of information. We can distribute that stuff so much faster now and so much more broadly than when it was uh, traditional media channels. So this is very much something that we're discussing right now as both government bodies, as policy, as individuals, as citizens, because it seems a mistake to curtail freedom, and yet we it's too hard not to have some kind of guarantees and verifications depending on what context we're working in. Mm -hmm.